Bitcoin's held as the gold standard of decentralization. I thought it was money. I spent it. Well, no, sorry. Comparing to Visa or MasterCard, it's a mess. Bitcoin obviously is slow. I don't think it'll be Bitcoin. I don't think it'll be ETH. It'll be Solana. That's the project I've been looking for this entire time. We can do something totally new and exciting. We're kind of there today. The blockchain is our source of truth. And I'm going to give you credit for being the first application to kill Solana. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Next Billion podcast. Here we are talking to the people which are onboarding the next billion people into crypto, the founders, the builders, the people that are really making it happen. And I have the pleasure today to be talking to someone who I think we have been in touch for a long time, maybe measured in years, but we've yeah. never really had a chance to actually get on a call. So so Brian Long from, uh, from Triton One, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. An absolute thrill. Um, it, it's fun to finally connect with you on video and for the, you know, we've missed each other so many times at events on the other side of the room. Can't quite catch up, but yeah, here we are. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's Breakpoint or, or anything like that, it seems like there's just been so much going on in all these different things. So I think there's a lot for us to discuss today, particularly on sort of the nitty gritty of blockchains and, and the infrastructure that powers them and particularly Solana as well. And I know that you guys, you know, our interactions with you guys for probably since the beginning of when Step started, I think, yeah. you know, you guys have been a really great help for us, you know, providing sort of services with nodes. We can get into that, I think, uh, a, a bit later, but uh, maybe just sort of introduce yourself, who you are, how'd you get into crypto and how'd you find mm -hmm. yourself here in Solana? Uh, so, as people know, I'm Brian Long, currently one of the co-founders of Triton One. I also run the Block Logic Validator, one of the original validators on Solana. And then I run Validators.app, which is a website about validators. So, uh, but going back to the beginning of how I got into crypto, I, I have a little claim to fame. It's going to be a lowercase f, by the way, and then also a claim to shame to go with it. They happen in pairs, unfortunately. They do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I first started messing around with Bitcoin very early. So I was mining Bitcoin back in late 2009, early 2010. Hey. Um, at, the, at the time, it was CPUs. So no graphics cards yet, no ASICs yet. And I actually hit a block and got a 50 coin reward on a CPU. Love it. And uh, so that, that's awesome, right? And then also my claim to shame is, oops, I thought it was money and I spent it. But I think there was an important lesson there, an important context of where my mind was at the time. And then it will explain why I was attracted to Solana later. But at the time, Bitcoin obviously is slow and it was being presented and marketed as internet money, right? So that you'd be able to walk into a coffee shop and you'd be able to pay with Bitcoin. Well, no, <laughs> sorry, not at, at the slow transaction speed that Bitcoin runs at. There, there was no way. So my comments at the time were, okay, this is really cool. I love the technology. This is a stepping stone to the future of money, but we're not there yet. And so with that, I just kind of thought it was money and I spent it and I bought some basic gear and you know some other stuff like that. So now today, unfortunately, I don't hold any Bitcoin, but that was an important lesson and it kind of set my frame of mind, right? So then move forward to a few years ago, Solana was still in development and not even doing dry runs or just kind of doing a few dry runs at the time. The labs team was really busy and a friend of a friend told me about what they were working on. And and he tried to explain proof of history to me. He didn't do a very good job, but it was a good enough job that I got it. <laughs> so, and immediately I said, okay, that's the project I've been looking for this entire time. How do I get involved? And the way for me to get involved was to be a validator, to volunteer during the dry run phase, and then to try to help build up the validator infrastructure. So that's super cool. I mean, it's very rare that I find another person of a similar vintage in Bitcoin. I remember CPU miners, like even just having a laptop and, you know, having that run the mining software, the, the CLI at the time and, and making a few coins here and there. That, that was awesome. But I guess maybe here's a question sort of going back to those days. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we pretty much had Bitcoin talk was the only place that uh, the people were talking about right. electronic digital money on the internet. Yeah. And it was very much, as you say, focused on payments or, hey, you can buy a, a coffee, you know, in a coffee shop with this electronic money. Isn't that cool? Do you think we have got there or have we swayed from that initial idea? And, you know, things have changed, I guess, in Bitcoin land over time. It's sort of morphed mm -hmm. more 
into a store of value than a form of payment. Um, yeah. What's your take on sort of maybe the philosophy or how that's changed since uh, when you first got into things compared with now? Yeah, I mean, the Bitcoin narrative did change and more now it's a, it's a digital goal, the store of money. Obviously with Lightning, you know, they're trying to make it faster to be that original vision of internet money. But personally for me, my attention has definitely moved on and uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is full of brilliant people that did absolutely amazing things that I didn't even envision at the time, right? It turned into something a lot more than I ever expected it would, which then led us to Solana where we take, you know, the speed and the programmability. And now again, we can do something totally new and exciting. So I do feel like we're kind of there today with Solana, uh, Solana Pay, Solana Mobile with the Saga phone, everything I've seen for the infrastructure of the software itself, especially what Fire Dancer is doing, it is completely within reach for Solana to meet the transaction goals, the speed goals that we've set. You know, so 50,000 TPS, yes, it's doable. And so to me, it feels like we're probably just about there, right? It's so close. And that there's a vision forward to say, yes, I, you know, we know how we can get there. I don't think it'll be Bitcoin. You know, I don't think it'll be ETH. It'll be Solana and maybe wrapped ETH and maybe wrapped Bitcoin <laughs> running on Solana, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Because in the early days, it was using Bitcoin to pay for coffee, right? And then there was, there, yeah. there was always that FX component involved. Then you have people like BitPay come along and build a business around like converting it for you and that sort of thing. But now we have the world of stable coins, right? So yeah, you know, if yeah. coffee is a dollar, we can literally pay a dollar. And yep. now it sort of comes down to the speed and that sort of thing. Do you think that the way that Solana and the ecosystem is right now, do you think maybe a lot more of these use cases might see prominence? I mean, you mentioned the phone, Solana Pay and that sort of thing. Are we going to see a renaissance of, of these sort of use cases like payments, particularly among other things, do you think? I would absolutely love to see that. And I do think it'll happen. There's a lot of integration issues. We'll soon get to the point where the technical issues are solved, but it's more of the human issues. We have to integrate with the payment system at the coffee shop. The owner of the coffee shop doesn't necessarily want to deal with multiple payment devices, right? They've got their main term terminal, they flip the screen, you do the tip, you sign, they get paid, they love that. And Solana needs to integrate with that system, right? Look at it from the point of view of the merchant. Do they really want to have a different tablet that they're going to pull out and then have you scan a QR code with your phone just to do the special thing on Solana that they're going to have to clear manually in the back end? That's the kind of problem that will need to be solved next. Not so much the technical piece, but that interface between the blockchain and between the merchant and between us. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I guess as well from from say a Bitcoin perspective or formerly Ethereum when there was still proof of work and now they've gone proof of stake as, as well. But one of the limiting factors for fast payments was the mechanism that transactions were validated, right? And in Bitcoin, it's proof of work and quite slow. Every 10 minutes, there's a batch of blocks. So are there compromises along the way that some people will say, oh yeah, sure, Solana's fast, but so is Visa or so is PayPal.com or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's like, there's like a spectrum there. And, you know, the more centralized you go, the faster you can go, the more decentralized. Is this a false sort of way to be looking at things? Or what's your sort of opinion on maybe the way that Solana is going about things in terms of decentralization? Maybe this brings into the discussion in a moment about sort of nodes and infrastructure and, and what you guys are doing. But do you think there's trade-offs there which have been made, which perhaps sort of negatively impact decentralization? I'm not sure I see much of the downside. And I think it's important to look at it from the merchant's point of view or the user's point of view. And the merchant and the user both care that they can have a confirmation that happens within a second or two, right? While you're standing at the counter. So that's a critical piece. Additionally, comparing to Visa or MasterCard, you know, for anybody who's ever seen the merchant side of a credit card transaction, it's a mess. You know, number one, you're paying your 2.9% plus all the other little add-on fees. The statement that they send you every month is so incredibly opaque, you have no idea what you're paying for. And the fact of the matter is for most retailers, if they can take 3% of their top line, which is what they're paying and credit card fees and move that down to profit, they have just increased their profit dramatically. And you know, if they're working on 10 or 20% margins, 
if you can throw 3% down at the bottom, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. And um, and so that's how they're going to look at it, is they're going to say, wow, I can save 3% if I do this thing. This is amazing. And so kind of focus on that. And then if the Nakamoto coefficient is 30 or 50 or 75, they don't care, right? They just need to know that their transactions are going to get through. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I guess you mentioned the, the Nakamoto coefficient there. That's be a good segue into what you guys are doing at Triton and RPC node and so on. So just for those out there that are not familiar with what is an RPC node, what's the purpose of it? And maybe sort of set the scene there of I'm on a dApp, maybe it's paying for a coffee, maybe it's some lender doing something, right? And I literally have a browser window open or I have a mobile app open and I want to press a button to do something. How is a node involved in this whole process of me pressing buttons and doing things? Yeah, so an RPC node is a high-performance database server specialized for blockchains. So your app, whether it's your phone or a website, is interacting with a back-end computer in the blockchain world. That's an RPC. There are different variations and flavors and implementations of that. Sometimes the user is interacting directly with the RPC node. Sometimes there's a middleware. So the application may have their own database backend that they're using that's being fed by by an RPC node, which is a part of the blockchain, a part of the cluster. And sometimes that there can be some confusion about what is Web3. You know, is it a client that's interacting directly with an RPC node, or is it a client that's maybe interacting with a high performance backend? So I usually try to explain to people or clarify that the blockchain is our source of truth. And the RPC node is your kind of your interface to get to that source of truth. Source of performance can come from somewhere else. It can either be a highly performant RPC node or it can be a separate backend that an application is running. Um, so I look at the RPC node as being the source of truth first, maybe a source of performance second after that. Got it. I think that's a really good way to think about it, right? Is like there is this thing out there called the blockchain, which often I think when you're talking to people that are new to it, this concept of telling them that there's a thing called a blockchain, it's like, cool, where do I go? Like, can I see it? Like, what do I have to press to go and see it? Um, and you can take them to block explorers and that sort of thing. But yeah, very interesting that, uh, you know, every app, every everything that, that is happening in Web3, it needs to connect to a node to actually make sure that that payment gets onto the blockchain and it actually, you know, gets there in time as well. So yeah, very interesting. So in terms of RPC, like does each application have their own? Does everyone have to run one of these servers? How are these projects managing it at the moment? Like you've got quite a lot of these larger projects, let's say in the case of Solana, a lot of people are using the public free nodes, but there's a bit of a bottleneck there. But how do apps usually think about running their own infrastructure or not, or, or using some middleman or something like that? And what are the trade-offs along the way? Sure, sure. So apps can certainly run their own infrastructure because it's just a back-end computing function that really anybody can do. There are challenges, <laughs> certainly. It is hard work. And some apps can and do run their own. The other apps might use a shared RPC service where you've got several applications where all of their users are uh, sharing the same back-end resources. And then others that have dedicated resources like Step does. So, you know, you have dedicated resources that you use to feed your own backend for analytics. And um, other applications, if they don't need the analytics, they may not need that middle layer. And maybe they're good to use a shared service. DeFi traders in particular, they always get the best performance out of dedicated servers. A shared service, generally speaking, is a little bit slower. And by a little bit, I'm talking milliseconds, right? But there can be inconsistent response times, things like that. So for a trader with a dedicated server, they know that they can always get the best possible performance. And in the trading world, milliseconds matter. Um, you know, if I become aware of a trade, even just a few milliseconds before you are aware of it, there's a chance that I can grab the profit. So for traders, it tends to be dedicated servers, one-to-one -one relationship, uh, one server, one trader, front-end applications, maybe it's a shared service where you can tolerate a little bit more latency, a little more inconsistency. And, and then again, some cases, people just run their own. Yeah. And I guess this sort of goes into what you mentioned before about this Nakamoto coefficient. You know, a lot of people, they're all running their own nodes and that's good for a network to have a lot more people validating transactions. And maybe 
to put it in context, sometimes there's FUD that goes around out there about the decentralization of Solana. I often tell people like, oh, there's an on and off switch. Is there like, cool, like tell me which node has the on and off switch. Let's press the button and see. But I guess this Nakamoto fission is a way to measure decentralization. Is there anything you can say about that of where Solana is in comparison to other places or how many nodes are out there? Like, are there 10? Or are there 10,000? I don't know. What, what's uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to take a real quick look to see if I can get a, an accurate number. But we're pushing <laughs> a couple thousand validator nodes on Solana right now. And the number that we have above the, the Nakamoto line, that's probably worth a just real quick definition. But the idea there is that you want to have the stake in a proof of stake network distributed as much as possible to minimize collusion. And if 34% of the active stake were to come together and collude, that they could censor certain transactions. So I could say, I'm not going to let this one process. I'm going to let this other one come through. So we want to prevent that from happening. So the Nakamoto coefficient is the number of nodes above that line to where they could collude. And we're well above 30 nodes, are we at now? Yeah, I think uh, it was like 31, 32, something like that. It's yeah, like right. Yeah, so it means that 31 different people have to come together to collude. That gets to be really difficult, right? You know, maybe you and I could do it, the two of us, uh, get somebody else in the room. Now they have a different opinion. And even with three people, it gets harder to collude. You bring in now, we need to, <laughs> yeah, right. At some point that just breaks down and it just doesn't work. So that's the importance of having more nodes above that line is it just gets harder and harder and harder to collude. There's also this component though of a single point of failure. You know, you wouldn't want to be in a situation where if one node goes down, that the cluster halts because it cannot form consensus. So if there was a, uh, a mythical blockchain with only three nodes and you need all three to form consensus and one of them goes offline, you know, now we've got a single point of failure problem. So again, you know, keeping the maximum number of nodes that you can handle on the cluster is good because when one or two go down, no big deal. We can still process transactions. We can still confirm in one to two seconds, you know, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe to put it into context as well, you know, when you were talking about that, I was thinking back in the day with, with Bitcoin. And since we've been around, Bitcoin has had 51% of the network owned by a single entity a few times. I remember when uh, gigahash.io, do you remember them? For like a period yeah. of like two weeks, they had 51% and then they had to like make some sort of new nodes, which they distributed the hashing power to reduce that number because everyone was freaking yep. out. And certainly in the early days, like I was 1% of the network at one stage when, when I yeah. first, I don't know if you remember the Butterfly Labs miner. I was buying Butterfly Labs uh, ASICs, the original Gen, which was super noisy. It was this little black box, and it was just the it was your gonna be st- yeah. Yeah, those yeah. little ones. And then they finally went to the uh, the longer form that was supposed to be a drop into a GPU, but it took so much power that you couldn't actually get it to run. So then you had to run it as an external thing. Yeah, I, I was buying a whole whole bunch of the Butterfly Lab stuff. They've all burned out. They didn't last. Yeah. Yeah, man. I remember those days. Like, But, you know, back then you could realistically have a sizable portion of, of the Bitcoin network. So yeah. often, yeah. you know, when Bitcoin's held as the gold standard of decentralization, which now because of all of the, the money involved and the Bitcoin, Bitcoin price, it's actually like if I want to get 51% of the hash rate in Bitcoin, I need to shell out a lot of money. We're talking many billions of dollars. I also need to own chip manufacturing in Taiwan. I also need to be able to collude all at the same time. So it's very hard, if not impossible. Yep. Um, Agreed. Yeah. Do that. But certainly in the early days, like it wasn't the case. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I guess, you know, Solana has some, and especially proof of stake and the use of delegating your funds to a validator, which validates blocks and, and does a good job. That's maybe quite a different concept that Bitcoin people are, are used to. But sort of moving on, what's Triton doing? What are you guys doing in the ecosystem? And who are your customers? And quick plug, we've been using you guys at Step since we started. Excellent work, always great, you know, support and, and so on. But how do you usually work with a project? And maybe walk yeah. us through that. Yeah, and I'll even give a little bit of historical context as well. But history here in Solana, of course, isn't that many months ago. Or well, you know, a couple of years ago. So uh, Triton is co-founded by myself and two others, Linus Kendall, Marco Bruken. And we took over the Solana mainnet for Solana Labs maybe a couple of years ago now. I'd, I'd have to actually go check. At the time, they were running it in the cloud. 
And we said, hey, we can do some bare metal and uh, we'll move everything to bare metal and we can run it for you. They were busy doing software development and said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So at that time, the Solana cluster had six RPC nodes. Today, with all the different RPC providers that are out there in the space, you know, you've got thousands of RPC nodes. So going back then, there were six on mainnet. And Serum had some, but not many. And that was kind of it. You know, this was a brand new network. It was a brand new cluster. There wasn't a lot of traffic. And there was this hackathon. And then along comes this group called Step, (laughs) Step Finance, you guys, and you decide you're going to do a coin offering on a weekend, and uh, which is great, no problem. But I'm going to give you credit for being the first application to kill Solana. Thank you. What what happened was the amount of traffic and the amount of interest that came in for your offering was so overwhelming we couldn't keep up, and uh, there was just these six little servers running. You know, and the amount of traffic was overwhelming. I had a backup validator that we repurposed for RPC so we could get that into the cluster to support you guys. Marco did the same thing. And um, and then Marco and Lena spent the entire weekend just basically trying to balance traffic, you know, move it around the world and just to help, you know, get this thing done, right? And that for us was the moment that we realized, oh, <laughs> this is going to be big, right? Look at how much potential we've got in this thing. I want to give credit to you as well, because you had recognized that both Marco and Lena had basically spent the weekend just trying to help you get your offering out the door. Heroic and, uh, job, by the way. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Absolutely heroic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and with not much, you know, uh, previous uh, discussion as well. I think it was quite, no, no. quite quick that we came to it, you know, like a right. day or two before. <laughs> yeah. So it was absolutely insane. You were very generous to those guys uh, who had volunteered their time over the weekend. But that was kind of, you know, the beginning. That was kind of how Triton started. It started as three guys were running six servers. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you know, things started to happen from there. Since then, we've grown. We're, we're now running several hundred servers. There are other RPC providers in the ecosystem that are also running hundreds of servers. So from those very humble, you know, roots or those very humble beginnings, we were able to grow a decent sized ecosystem that, that Solana as we know it today. Let's see. So Triton One, we tend to sp- specialize in on DeFi. So most of our clients are in the DeFi space. Whether it's uh, some of the OG teams like Step, Orca, Mango, and and many, many, many others. We do work with uh, traders as well. So we, we specialize in low latency trading environments. And most of our fleet is dedicated nodes. So we have a shared service that we use for front ends, but you know, by and large, the, the vast majority of what we do, dedicated nodes, bespoke installations, trying to tune things specifically for that particular customer. Contributions to the ecosystem. We've written a couple of the Geyser plugins. Geyser is RPC 2.0 for Solana. We wrote the SQS plugin. We helped Mango write the gRPC plugin. Christian did a ton of work on that, so that's mostly his. But we do have now a rework of that that we've done, which opens the door for a better version of PubSub on Solana. And uh, which has been one of the irritants for anybody in the ecosystem is Solana Pub Sub isn't really good. But, you know, so we think that we've, we're at the point where we're making that better using Geyser and gRPC. So we do contribute back to the ecosystem through open source tools and then just trying to be active, you know, in Discord, be active in the community, just helping people out any way that we can to grow the ecosystem and make it better. Absolutely. I think that activity is also something that's a testament to, that makes you guys stand out as well. Like if you go into the Solana Discord and you go into the validator chat or anything like that, you guys are always in there. There's always uh, really good discussions going on. And it's really cool that, that Step had a hand in starting, you know, Triton's yeah. journey, which is amazing. So, and as well, maybe this is, you know, another thing we can talk about is a lot of apps, like certainly from our perspective, Step is a, a dashboard and we show people's money and so on. And a lot of these different apps, like they focus on their thing. And RPCs is kind of like, hey, I just want the infrastructure to work so that I can focus on building my DAP and, and doing that kind of thing. I think now that the cool thing which I've seen in the last few months is projects may be looking to run their own validator. Is that a trend which perhaps you've seen And uh, yeah, what do you think about that? I think that's a really cool idea. I think it's phenomenal. I want to see more of it. And in 2023 in particular, I hope this is the year that we see many, many, many dApps 
also do their own branded validators. There are benefits to the app above and beyond just simply running a validator and maybe earning a commission on the rewards. In the new world of Solana, we're using Quick to send transactions. If it's an application where the users are, are sending transactions and it's critical that the transaction get through, so think DeFi, think NFTs, anybody who's buying and selling NFTs, your ability to land a transaction is important. Solana, as many people probably know, has switched to a technology called Quick for sending transactions. A Quick allows the validators to have a defense against bots so that we as validators can limit the amount of traffic coming in. So we avoid getting overwhelmed and we avoid taking the cluster down. So that contention now that we see during big events, it can be difficult to get a transaction through unless you run a stake validator. Um, so what we're seeing there is that one of the NFT marketplaces, exchange.art, they recently spun up theirs. And the idea is that anybody who's sending a transaction through their platform will then be able to have priority on the cluster because it's going through their validator. Other cases, read latency is really important. And then there are some tricks that we can do to kind of minimize read latency so the refreshes come a little bit faster on the website. But the point there, I guess, is that there's benefits above and beyond just getting a commission on rewards, that an application can be a better app if it runs a validator. Yeah, that's awesome. I actually didn't realize that there was, you know, really sort of good gains to, to be made in terms of responsiveness and stuff like that. So, hey, that's a trend I love seeing. I know a lot more sort of dApps are looking to do that. We're going to be doing that as well uh, yep. with you guys. I think that's going to be really cool. And hey, at the end of the day, all of these dApps that are doing their own crazy things, like if they're all doing their own validator as well and introducing their community to the idea of staking and, and as well, the, the cool thing about this is that you can stake on someone's validator and even if the validator blows up or disappears your money is not gone it's not right. uh, you know it also doesn't just fizzle so i think that's another yep. thing that you know when i was talking to people about it they were like well what happens if these guys go down what if i stake my money with you and you'd run away with it tomorrow but the the, the yeah. stake is actually it's not like the coins don't live in a particular wallet on the validator's server or anything like that. It's actually held uh, by the network. So it's kind of, you know, why not? You know, uh, I think is is where, where we're at with a lot of this. Uh, as well, so I guess you've seen quite a bit of an evolution of Solana since day one and, you know, really getting it started to where we are now with thousands of different nodes and huge clusters and people doing stuff. And you mentioned Quick as well as one of the, the sort of new technologies. And, and I think last year, you know, people remember, unfortunately, the times when Solana got, you know, too much traffic to, to some of these yeah. different validators. And and how how do you think the network is going now with, with some of these recent updates like Quick, um, like some of the other network improvements? Are we doing better? Well, I'm going to say yes, uh, with probably some caveats, because there will be some people who right now who might t completely disagree with me. <laughs> no, it's not going well at all. I think it's going well in the sense that the validators are not falling over during big events. We have been hearing the last few days in particular with bonk. Everybody's getting bonked right now. That's generated a ton of traffic. We are hearing cases now where people are having a hard time getting their transactions to land and that there's contention, there's, there's resource contention on the validators. That's not a bad thing in my mind. It means that what we're doing is actually working, that the cluster is not falling over during big events. So that's a huge win. I think that's better. But where we need to go from here is that the validators are the guardians of the cluster. And it's our job to be the gatekeepers as well for what gets in, uh, what gets processed, and what gets recorded to chain. And that applications can work with validators in order to get their transactions through. It'll be in a more controlled environment, right? So that the validators have a little more control over what's actually happening, and that we won't be subject to anonymous bot attacks. And so uh, that, that final piece of getting the interface between the validators and the apps for transaction delivery, that's another thing that we need to work on this year. We can do a much better job there. But so far, the idea is working. Great. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, things seem to be going quite well. We're seeing a really big change, I think, in the network in the last six months 
where TPS is like 3,000 or something. I think sometimes yeah. we'll post screenshots yeah. of crazy high numbers like 6,000. And yeah. is this where the, the local fee markets, I don't know if you're familiar with, with this one as well, but the uh, the local mm-hmm. fee market kind of thing that was on a per app basis or something like that, which Solana mm-hmm. implemented, is that also helping with this sort of bot problem or you know, people spamming? Yeah, it is. I think, again, we've got some more work to do there as well. The implementation is working, but it's not perfect. You know, we can see cases where a trader will add a priority fee to have a transaction gain higher priority on the validators. But there's still a little bit of ordering issues there that it is possible that if somebody had a transaction with zero extra fee or zero priority fee, if they were several milliseconds ahead of you, they might actually still get in line uh, before you do. So you're paying a higher fee, but you didn't get what you expected. So it's not quite perfect. Anatoly and the labs engineers have talked about how to kind of fix that up. And so that'll be something that, again, we're going to work on going forward. But the priority fees do help. They don't help, though, with quick contention. So, you know, actually getting the transaction onto the validators into the cluster, that's where the quick is. So there's kind of that step that happens before the priority fees and they both need to work together. So again, I think 12 months from now, it'll be a different conversation on both of those topics to where they've been implemented and things are running even better. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and this kind of brings up, you know, where are we going for this year? It's a, it's a new year. We're, uh, we've put the horrible 2022 behind us with all of the crazy things and shenanigans going on. But what's it looking like maybe on the development side, technology side, or maybe also yourselves at Triton? What do you see as the, the new developments or things which you're excited about or working on in the new year? Yeah, so a couple of things that we're working on, one I've already touched on is uh, redoing PubSub for uh, Solana RPC. And if anybody's not super technical, PubSub is a way for the server to push data to the client instead of the client pulling or you know polling for data. So uh, that mechanism today and Solana of RPC, it, it falls down quickly under pressure. It doesn't take too many connections or too many clients to really start to cause problems with that process. So uh, reinventing that using a new technology called Geyser and then gRPC, the acronyms don't need to matter for most people. It's basically just saying, look, it's going to be a better way to push transactions or push data out to the client. So we're working on that now. We're actually expecting to open source that within the next few weeks. So we've been testing it internally. We've got it in production internally. In some cases, it's feeling good. A few beta clients using it, again, it's feeling good. So we think we're finally ready to outsource that piece. And then additionally, we're working on some other backend stuff to make Solana RPC more performant. Uh, there are some types of queries that just frankly, it's a, it's a round peg in a square hole problem or a square peg in a round hole problem, however you like your pegs and your holes. So the reality is that there are some queries that just, they shouldn't be done the way they're done. It's just wrong. So what we're trying to do is pull some of those out, handle those in a different way so they can be much more performant. And if anybody who's a dev on Solana knows all about get program accounts, it's notorious. Everybody hates it. That one in particular, we're trying to fix. And we're seriously talking 10x better performance improvement. So that, that's been uh, the bane of our existence yeah, for so long. Yeah. I remember I remember yep. when Step App was falling over just because everyone was individually yep. polling RPC nodes and they were connecting and get multiple yeah. accounts it was blowing everything up. It was horrible. <laughs> yeah, it was. The original serum uh, front ends, same thing. Just the machines would just wilt and fall over immediately. And uh, it was frustrating for us. It was frustrating for you. Uh, and of course, frustrating for the user, the person who matters. And yeah, so we're, we're trying to get that fixed up too. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I guess as well, you know, how can people get involved or there's, you know, Solana has a lot of different projects and hackathons and all sorts of different things happening. There's there's new devs coming into the ecosystem. What would be your message to to them to think about when they're thinking about their, their infrastructure needs for the app that they're doing? Or how can they get in contact with you guys? And how does these discussions usually start? Is it someone just DMing you on Twitter or what's the steps? Yeah, for us, it's been mostly referrals. And it is. It's it's going to be DMs. It's uh, getting a hold of us for Signal, uh, Telegram, I mean. And yeah, so it tends to be referrals in from clients and uh, people going to our website. But how do people get involved in general with Solana is kind of a, a different question. 
Well, much different question. And uh, which we do get, some people will say, well, how do I get involved? The first thing to think about is don't don't wait for somebody to tell you what to do. Look for something that looks like it's broken. And if it looks broken to you, it probably is broken. Everybody else probably sees it. They're all just too busy and they haven't had time to fix it, right? So if you see something that looks broken, work on it. Work on the problem. Try to find a way to fix it. The community always rewards, you know, that kind of an effort. Even documentation. But sometimes, you know, people say, I'm not super technical. You know, how do I get involved if I'm not super technical? I think everybody agrees the documentation kind of sucks. You know, we could all do a better job. So there might be other ways to do that, you know, to get involved that way. So don't don't wait. Just find an opportunity, grab it, own it, and get involved. Let's see. When it comes to RPC in particular, teams do need to work with private RPC operators on Solana. The free public endpoints right now are severe limited to where they're basically intended to be used by the validators to monitor and maintain the health of the cluster, that they're used by the Solana Explorer, some other limited applications. But if you're just starting your new app, you definitely want to get a hold of a private RPC provider, start out on a cheap shared plan uh, to get it up and running, and then you'll scale and grow from there. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think the, the public nodes are great. You know, it's kind of like you can experiment and get your, your first version of your app up and running just using that. But I think when you're ready to, to actually onboard customers, you know, those, they're just too overwhelmed at the moment. So certainly yeah. uh, it makes sense having your own infrastructure. Well, well thank you so much for, for coming uh, on the podcast today. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, where can people reach you and, and Triton, blog, Twitter, anywhere else? Where should they yeah, great. reach out? Yeah, I appreciate that. On on the web or www.triton.one. On Twitter, um, I'm usually just doing most of my Twittering on my my own personal handle, at Brian Long. That's Brian with an I. And uh, then I'm also the same on Telegram too. And let's see, Twitter for Triton One, we're at Triton underscore one. So, yeah. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on board today. Uh, it, it has been a pleasure. I think, you know, people have been able to learn a little bit about the infrastructure world and what really goes on behind the scenes when people are building all of these apps to, to onboard this next billion people. But uh, definitely, if you haven't already, check out Triton, have a chat with Brian. They've been great, you know, for steps, so I can certainly attest to that. But uh, all the best. And uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon sometime. Thank you very much. Yeah, Brian. thanks, George. Yeah, absolute blast. Thank you very much. Cheers. We'll see you.